Okay, hi everyone. That's as you're probably expecting is the title of the talk. If that's not a talk you're expecting, you could be in the wrong room. And I'm Nick Dunn. I'll just explain how I originally got into this. I was originally a, a secure software developer who spent uh, quite a bit of time working on online banking and uh, eventually found out uh, I could have uh, far more fun and a more interesting time of my life by breaking things instead of building them and criticising other people's work. And I moved into this uh, security consultancy area, began to work on penetration testing, a lot of threat modelling, code review over the years. So a, a lot of this uh, knowledge that's been coming out now is co comes from that original work and design and development and things I've learned over the years, threat modelling and general security consultancy. What we're going to be talking today is uh, a quick review of conventional threat modelling, moving on to then when that sort of threat modelling isn't enough and more needs to be done, and a bit of a process or checklist to recognise when you should move into that area and, and when to try something different. And then we'll work through an example and questions, obviously, at the end. Before I start, how many people have done threat modelling before? And how many people are new to it? Okay, so this first part, then it'll be a review for some of you and an introduction for the rest of you. And before I start, although I'm calling this the conventional way or a standard method, there is there's no accepted definite right or wrong way to do it. There's a few different approaches, but what we'll discuss first is the the more conventional way that it's usually done. And you can all read a lot faster than I can talk, so I'm not going to read out every line on every slide. But essentially, threat modelling is a, it's conceptually simple. It's get, um, gaining some general idea of what can go wrong with the application and then moving on to look at how you can fix or further verify that and hopefully reviewing what you've done and improving for next time. And the, the way we're going to talk about this, the more conventional way of doing it is to sit with some subject matter experts and do what we call decomposing the application. We generally start with uh, their view of how the system works and their architectural diagrams and logical diagrams before moving on to doing your own diagrams to model how data flows through the application, which usually highlights where things can go horribly wrong. That, that will lead to you coming up with your threats, which you will then rank or quantify. <laughs> And our data flow diagrams are built of these components. Again, it's diff very different from a conventional sort of architecture diagram. It's quite user-friendly, easier for someone to understand. And as you model the data flow, you should end up with something some ranking of threats along these lines where we have uh, the stride method that's conventionally used will be spoofing whether you can impersonate another user or another system. Tampering for anyone who's done a lot of penetration testing is 
one of the principal areas we find a lot of fun uh, modifying the parameters and attempting to cause unexpected behaviour. And by unexpected, I do mean things going wrong. Repudiation. Um, <coughs> generally, we'd look at falsifying an audit trail, making it look like something's happened that hasn't happened, or concealing previous activities. <coughs> like a good example of that would be making a cash withdrawal appear not to have happened. Um, information disclosure is the the excessive exposure or exposure of information you might not have wanted end users to see. Sometimes it can be detailed or sensitive data about a person, or you could apply the same principle equally to uh, technical error messages that reveal data about backend systems. Denial of service is going to be something that you're, I'm sure, all familiar with. And finally, the E for elevation of privilege, where an attacker would at attempt to get higher levels than they should be permitted to have. So carrying out activities normally for an administrator, but without... Uh, Obviously, without prepossessing the admin login. So that's all a bit abstract. I appreciate uh, for anyone who hasn't done it before, that uh, probably needs an example to make things a bit more concrete. So this is going to be far simpler than something you would do in real life. But if you consider a, a completely fictitious... Uh, online service that sells things to people. I'm sure you can imagine the sort of thing. We might speak to the developers and come up with some high-level diagram like this that shows how data flows through the system and through different trust boundaries. So for the user interacting, any data that comes from them would be untrusted data moving from there across into what should be a demilitarized zone within where, where the application sits. With that interacting further with stuff on the corporate network, again, data flowing both ways. And you'd have different levels of trust there applied to these this data that flows through. And you would go on to use those stride techniques that I've just been talking about to build up this uh, ranking of threats that could come from a system like that. There's all the typical sort of things that you would come up with if you were threat modeling any web application. Although if you'd had two days to do it and you just handed in that, you'd obviously have questions asked of yourself. Now, there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages to this approach. It's, it works very well for conventional web applications, networked applications, and mobile applications, um, because really that's what the process was originally designed for. Uh, uh, that's because the process has been designed for those sort of applications, it generally gives very good results in terms of coming up with a test plan or coming up with design issues. Um, as you can see, I'm saying it works well most of the time, and that implies, obviously, there's times it doesn't work so well. Um, it uh, and for certain types of non-standard applications, it can cause you to go through this process just assessing it as if it was a standard web application. You, you can introduce blind spots and realize if you do it that way, you may have missed issues. 
Um, so if we take a look at non some non-standard sort of compromises that have happened over the years. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the story of Bearings Bank and Nick Leeson. He, at some point in his life, got uh, used his uh, special privileges to set up something on the production system called Error Account 8888, which was used to hide away an error by one of his staff that had caused the bank to lose several million pounds from someone choosing the wrong option as part of a, a trade. I should explain, Bearings Bank were at this time one of the oldest merchant banks in the world and had the Queen as one of their clients. Um, as he started to take riskier and riskier trades to trap like, like a gambler trying to pay off his debts with one big sort of win. He gradually built up bigger and bigger losses that, that were all being moved to this account, which was basically the result of giving too many permission, the wrong sort of permissions to a single user and a sort of lack of auditing on that lack of correct auditing, not sh tracking <coughs> the trades correctly. And you could argue a minor bit of social engineering because he did co convince a couple of IT people that this was a training account on a live system. It does beg the question of why the people being trained with that account were gradually losing millions and millions <laughs> over a period of of a couple of weeks, but that result eventually caused the bank to announce losses of £850 million in the 90s when that was a lot of money and it caused the closing of the bank. I mean, more than it is now, obviously, it's still a lot. In the case of Stuxnet, much more recent, and I'm sure more of you have heard of that, uh, it appeared from deconstructing the exploits that had been deployed afterwards. Someone appeared to have used publicity photos of the president walking around the nuclear facilities to identify which versions of Windows were being run in the facility, which had then led to a situation uh, you could argue a lack of good desktop policy and locking down had resulted in USB keys being used to transfer exploits to, to those systems, which were then used to attack centrifuges used for uranium refinements on, on those systems. Um, at that time, <coughs> there the were... The whole idea of exploiting the hardware to refine the uranium was a bit of a new thing. It was the first sort of exploit I think anyone had developed for these Siemens uranium refining devices. Or in the case of the Estonian online services, there was a massive DDoS against government systems and banking systems there. <coughs> where in their case it caused a major problem because the majority of the population, overwhelming majority, did all their interaction with government services online and almost the entirety of their banking online. But there was a further unforeseen consequence of that, that some of the banks shut down their systems in order to reconstruct things during the DOS attack which cut off their access to ATM machines, which left the majority of the population of Estonia unable to use an ATM at home or abroad. Which, uh, it's easy to be wise after the event, but I think there's a few things there that wouldn't have been caught in the conventional 
threat modeling diagram and stride process we've just looked at. And uh, I'd started thinking about this uh, over the last uh, 18 months or so. I first looked at, been asked to develop a threat model for a mainframe uh, and then been taken down this whole route inside my head of, uh, okay, have you got fire extinguishers in here? <laughs> Are they the sort that would damage the hardware? Are you logging visitors? What's the temperature control system? Is the temperature control system accessed online? And I found myself going down this route more and more as we started to look at medical devices and machine learning systems. Well, we find ourselves looking at some quite specialised or unconventional bespoke systems that were then interacting over a perfectly normal HTTP channel or, or similar with regular conventional systems. And I sort of wanted to think about how we could do this in the threat modelling process. There's a guy called Nicholas Nassim Taleb who wrote a book called The Black Swan that talks about the some of the unexpected events that can have certain catastrophic or serious consequences that were unforeseen at the time. And he gives a sort of simplistic example that a turkey that's being fed every day by humans might think, hypothetically, because it can't think really, that, uh, wow, these humans are amazing. They feed me every day. This is a really good process. Things are working out well. And the turkey proceeds along those lines until Thanksgiving arrives uh, and s suddenly sees, uh, yeah, there was an unforeseen event there. And so I started to look at these uh, sort of set of steps we could use to decide when we needed to use not just the normal stride enumeration, but maybe bolt on a few other sort of things that we could look at. And I will be putting checklists online for all of this later. But in general, I, I decided if the target utilizes particularly new concepts or non-traditional technologies, like some of the stuff we've just spoken about, medical devices, machine learning or quantum computing that's feeding its data into a conventional system, a system that uses specialized hardware, like a mainframe or a quantum computer or refining uranium, something that depends heavily on processes as well as technology. And th then you've probably got a, a reasonable case for stepping out, for doing the stride process in the normal way, but then stepping outside and taking a look at what else could go wrong. <coughs> the reason I've, I've got more detailed checklists that I'm going to put online to give a, a clear, a, a more detailed way to go through this, but we'll use a high level version for now to keep things short and simple. <coughs> but the reason for ch using checklists, pilots, generally have a checklist before they take off because it's a nice simple way of getting competent, skilled people to to make sure that nothing's missed and that a process runs smoothly. For trivia fans, the World Health Organization introduced surgery checklists for surgeons in 2009 which reduced death rates from 0.8% to 1.5%. And the other sort of scary part of that is, as well as reducing death rates, there were 
all the sorts of things that you'd want to avoid as a surgeon, like swabs being left inside people, the wrong limb being amputated. Um, th that was the general aim of the checklist. <coughs> so for this sort of process, I thought of things like, you should be looking whether it has a physical attack surface with... Uh, I've already mentioned medical devices earlier, and one of the reasons I had to step outside the process there was not only because these devices had plugged into a human at one end on the data flow diagram, which is quite sobering when you're assessing it. Um, th th there's also the whole thing of is logging being stored on removable media? Could you deliberately mistreat someone and then remove the logs. C can uh, a laptop be plugged into it in order to service it? And I is that going to cause issues or allow someone to operate the machine in a way that it normally wouldn't be? Um, we've spoken earlier about uh, new and experimental technologies in terms of quantum computing or machine learning. How sure are you that the data you're being, that's coming out of that system is correct? How sure are you that the data going into that system is correct? Do you even know that it's been built and programmed properly? And, of course, as we've said earlier, there's always with these systems, a channel running between the conventional system and, and the new sort of super wizzy system that's going to save the world, which offers further chances of compromise. Algorithm opacity was, of course, a, a thing I've thought of it in to, when we've been looking at machine learning systems. Do you even know that the result is correct? Are those results correctable? Can they be corrected? Is there even any way of fixing the system afterwards? Um, for banking, like when I've talked about bribe, blackmail here, it's, it's sometimes seen in the financial sector as an additional risk that someone could hire some temporary staff and just bribe them to take photos or pass on details, misbehave generally. It's often a lot cheaper than going through the firewall or doing a generally technical method. We've already spoken about Stuxnet. Mainframes and quantum computing uh, are other things that depend on some place that trust heavily in some control of their environment with some external piece of hardware. So that's an additional threat you can look at. Uh, the cost of running a quantum computer is enormous, so... If someone is able to compromise that the, the environmental temperature controls, that can cause huge cost overruns for someone. It can cause the other things we've spoken about, about incorrect data that you could, may not even be certain is incorrect. Backups were another sort of thing that we'd consider it in, in the two. In terms of the mainframe issue, there's been times in the past where people have backed up every night or every week and had plen huge arrays of backups ready to restore the system, but then it's been burned down in the same fire that burned down the rest of the building <coughs> and destroyed the system that was protected. And there's always... Uh, as we've said, with, with the point of view of hiring a malicious insider or bribing someone, it's important to look at the, the path of least resistance. How would I do this if I was an attacker? 
there's uh, a common thing in threat modeling and pen testing where you're told to think like an attacker, which is possibly not the most helpful thing if you've got to imagine how an attacker thinks. I think it's far more helpful to look at, at an attacker's objectives and go through some checklist of what data do I have? What's the value to that of that being sold on? What's the value to someone of that being corrupted? Can a DOS attack benefit someone else, as in online gambling, where I used to work for a company that did online gambling, and for them, they would have a DOS attempt roughly once or twice a month, along with a ransom demand. So if we look at ways of putting this into practice, we'll look at uh, if someone's asked to model a machine learning system, we can see it falls into those criteria where there are, there are some processes and procedures taking place in the machine learning system that affects the behavior of external systems holding important data, could be medical data, financial data, it has those uh, critical things of algorithm opacity. We really don't know whether or not it's genuinely working as it should do. And so in that situation, if we were attempting to look at something like that, we would go through this process of following the stride model and then looking for whatever else we could do afterwards that falls outside the, non, the, the regular stride thing. So I appreciate that it may look a little bit intimidating at first sight. <coughs> but uh, the, the real things to be aware of here is what we've talked about, about boundaries and separation of different systems that are interacting as part of a very critical process. Um, for a supervised learning, th machine learning system, there'd be some training data that's fed in initially to help it make its decisions and produce a model. You, you, that could, and then that model will be used to to carry out actions against live data, which will then result in some control of some external system, which could be uh, fraud detection systems, face recognition. But generally, the, the real point is that this external system is being controlled by separated Un little understood processes that frequently fall out into the remit of other companies or third parties. Or some weird process of data gathering that you may have had little control over or may not have thought through completely. So in the case of machine learning systems, as I said, there's a few things that would lie outside the typical stride method of doing it, um, which could expose features in inverted commas that an attacker might want to <coughs> make use of. <coughs> Things we typically look at from an adversarial point of view of ML is bias that can <coughs> come from bad data, bad processing of good data. Um, and unintended features that could assist an attacker. I appreciate some of that's a bit abstract. If you imagine a company that has so many sort of feedback uh, messages coming in that there's a machine learning system set to, to answer them and to send 
make an appropriate response to a person, if someone found it a way, the right words to use to cause that system to automatically give refunds, that then that's a way this sort of thing could cause a financial loss from interfering with the model or taking advantage of features of the model. The threats that sort of specific to the training data, it has, uh, has the training data been set up correctly? Has it, is it causing the model to behave as you would expect it to and as it should do? There's uh, a well-known example. The US military had thought they devised a system that could recognise tanks from aerial photographs, which worked uh, with 100% accuracy on the training data, but at around 2 or 3% accuracy in real life. Um, it, it had been trained entirely with, to recognise tanks in photos that had no clouds, and so it was just saying tank whenever it saw a photo with no clouds, and no tank when it saw a photo with clouds. <laughs> <coughs> So, uh, always a good thing to be aware of if you're looking at this kind of thing. In terms of the production data, there's, d there are known instances of people looking at anonymized data and being able to identify real people from it or personal data. And there are cases of, uh, like, or, or there's certainly the possibility of bad data deliberately introduced to the training process to cause the model to not function correctly. I realise I'm running over for a bit, so I'll just uh, quickly run through this. Uh, all of these using the checklists can be applied to other sorts of systems. In the mainframe, there's the issue around the communication channels, the specialised technologies, and as for quantum computing and medical devices, similar environment issues. Basically, there's different ways of extending strides. I'll put the slides online so you can go to those links. But quick summary, threat modelling is great. <laughs> but don't, uh, don't, don't assume it's fallible just because it misses attacks. Just look for ways you can reiterate, do things differently next time. Definitely do not focus on technical attacks to the exclusion of deciding whether your chief is online, but well, to decide to allowing people to interfere with things in other ways. Always adapt your methods to what you're looking at. Any questions?